So I'll try and give a bit of a counterpoint to uh, Bill's talk and to some extent uh, Jeff's talk. So you'll have uh, three perspectives on the hardware space. <clears throat> and I wasn't going to, but just for Bill, I'm going to work out somewhere where I can say this is a better GPU than GPU. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> We're all here because we believe we're onto something big. Uh, possibly the biggest transition that humanity has ever been through. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, the important point I want to make is that we are, by analogy with the harnessing of machine power, roughly at the point of 250 years ago, where Mr. Trevithick and Mr. Watt amazed themselves by building a machine that had more power than a horse. <laughs> but of course, they could not envisage that I would fly here yesterday by jet aeroplane in order to talk to you. That was the ultimate out outcome so far of their work. <clears throat> Likewise, we don't know where we're going. And the uncertainty of what it is we need to do strongly informs what we need to do in the near future. Try and make that point. The, the important thing is that there's never been a bigger driver to reinvent or at least re-examine everything we think we know about computing. Uh, in other words, this, this is a target that's big enough for us to question everything. Hardware, software, even what we mean by programming. <clears throat> so, so far in uh, machine intelligence compute, there are really three pieces. And uh, we sort of over-concentrate on one of them, which is training models or getting models to optimize. We're starting to look at the other two pieces uh, that also need to be accelerated. Um, one is discovering good model structures, architecture search, if you like. Uh, and the other is uh, simulating environments. So we don't have to drive cars into things to realize, or well, to, for them to learn not to drive into things. And uh, to me, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of concentration on tensors, a lot of use of the tensor word in marketing. <laughs> I don't think the tensors are the interesting new thing about the models and the workload here, actually. I think the graph is the interesting thing. Now, right down at the vertices of the graph, sure, we have tensors. Um, but in a sense, they're not very new. They're not very exciting. And actually, we know how to do those. <clears throat> now, what generally happens when a new, really important workload comes along uh, with a lot of economic potential, certainly, you know, in this case, a lot of societal potential, is that stuff changes. I very, very much doubt that in 10 years' time, we'll be using machines that look anything like today's machines to do intelligence. I think new machines will arise. Uh, we have a candidate for one of those. I'm sure there will be others. And uh, just to sort of highlight the extent to which we've concentrated on the dot products. Uh, this is roughly the fraction of headline performance you get out of today's platforms when you train a ResNet 50. Um, so I'm not saying these are bad designs, because I've included us here. Colossus is the graph core machine. Um, but you can almost guarantee if you buy a machine that's labeled 100 teraflops, you'll never get anything like that on the applications we're currently using. Now, what that says is that we are bumping up against Amdahl's law in that area. In other words, we've done such a good job of accelerating dot products that that's not a problem anymore. That's no longer a significant part of the workload. We need to concentrate on everything else. <coughs> These <coughs> three examples are not really supposed to be equivalent. Um, Jeff's just told us the uh, TPU number's gone up. Uh, that TPU, of course, also burns a lot more power than the other two. So they're not really comparable, but all the numbers are low. That's what I'm saying. So our comprehension, our understanding, and our mechanization of uh, machine intelligence is very nascent. Um, I certainly agree wholeheartedly with people who say, until we know what we want to build, we should build highly programmable machines. The last thing we need to build right now is a chip that does CNNs. I know there are lots of people who are setting out to do precisely that. But actually, I suspect that's completely the wrong direction. Um, so 
<laughs> if you'd set out to build a machine learning chip 10 years ago, you would certainly not have built something that does CNNs because they weren't hot then. You might have built something that did decision trees or support vector machines. Uh, in five years' time, it could be something else. Could not be SGD. Um, <clears throat> so models and algorithms are changing all the time, certainly every year, sometimes every month. Um, we do know there's a huge compute demand, um, and there are a few things we can lean on. So a lot of what we're interested in doing is uh, interpreting or modeling the physical world, and the physical world has invariances. It has spatial invariances, which we often represent as convolutions. It has uh, time invariances that we represent as recurrences. Um, we can build machines that lean on those. We also know we're manipulating probability distributions, stochastically learned. Um, so nothing is very high precision. We can lean on that. We can build low precision machines. Uh, most importantly, because we don't really know what we want to do yet, we'd better make it really easy to program. In other words, having a simple programming abstraction would be right at the top of my list. Um, and uh, I don't really believe there's much of a case for building machines that do either training or inference. I think you just need to build machines that do both. Uh, so suppose we want, I, I'd like to ask um, various customers I come across <laughs> how much more performance they would like. And uh, sometimes they say thousands, sometimes they say a million. On one case they've said infinite, I think he was exaggerating. <laughs> Um, but suppose we want 1,000 times performance in the next decade, in the next 10 years. Uh, first question is, how much of that will come for free? I don't quite agree with Bill. Moore's law is not dead. Uh, it's just not as exciting as it was. Um, in fact, the, the era of kind of amazing scaling of silicon ended about 2005. Um, but we still have a form of scaling. Uh, but this form of scaling now is, is um, power limited. And as, as a rough, very rough guide, the power that any chip uh, consumes is a function of its capacitance and the voltage you operate it at and how fast you operate it. CV squared F <clears throat> with some constant of proportionality. Now, the blue things are stacks of wires. They're, these are roughly to scale. Um, they get smaller with every passing generation. Uh, the wires are actually about that shape. They're about twice as tall as they are wide. Spacing is about the same as the width. The vertical spacing is about the same as the height. Um, as you shrink them, uh, you get roughly 2x for each process shrink, roughly 2x the number of crossing points. Uh, and actually, we can say so roughly 2x the routing density, if you like. And we can build transistors uh, that also scale by the same amount. So the number of transistors goes up by a factor of 2. Now, that aspect of Moore's law still holds. And we'll hold for a few more generations. Let's say over the next three generations, which is roughly 10 years now. <clears throat> so we will get more transistors. The problem is caused by the fact that the capacitance density goes up. It goes up as root 2. Uh, actually, you can see on these numbers, these are foundry numbers. We're doing slightly better than root 2 over the last four or five generations. But roughly speaking, root 2. So in order to hold power constant, because we're power limited, and assuming we want the same frequency, so that from the 2x number of transistors we can get 2x performance, uh, we need to drop the voltage by about 20% per process generation. And that's really hard. But that's the best case. So the best case we can do is get twice as many transistors running at the same power and at the same frequency. <clears throat> now, in practice, if you look at the way uh, uh, big Xeon server processors have scaled over the last five generations, um, they haven't achieved that best case. They've achieved about half of it. <clears throat> so rather than maintaining uh, throughput per watt, uh, at the scaling at the same rate as transistors per chip, they get about half that scaling. In other words, roughly a root two. So actually, that's probably a much more realistic future over the next 10 years than the best case scaling of 2x. So we still get something. We get twice as many transistors, but unfortunately we only get root two, the throughput per watt. Now this means that the amount of active logic on a die falls. Well, best case, it stays the same. Likely case, the Xeon scaling case, it falls. In other words, you can power less and less of the chip. You still get some speed up because you get many more transistors, 
So the fact that you can only power less of them, you still get more performance, roughly root two per generation. Um, but the big question is, what are you gonna do with the area that's not powered? <clears throat> and my answer to that is memory. Memory is very low power density or can be very low power density. And memory right next to your logic can be super useful. And we need to learn to leverage local memory. This is the prime real estate that Bill was talking about. We're gonna be able to build more and more prime real estate on the chip for the simple reason that we can't build more and more logic. So roughly speaking, natural process scaling is gonna get us 10x, say, from three generations, very best case, unlikely. More likely square root of that. So 3x, probably. You're gonna get roughly 3x the throughput performance in 10 years. So for 100x or 1,000x then, um, you're gonna have to, it's gonna have to come from something completely different. And uh, I think it's gonna come from two directions. It's gonna come from connecting chips together to act like bigger chips that have a bigger power budget. And we see more and more interest in using hundreds or thousands of chips today. Um, and it's gonna come from architecture, new architecture ideas. And uh, I've been doing microprocessor design for 35 years and my number one piece of learning is that new hardware architecture doesn't take you very far unless you co-evolve the software. And in this world, you also need to co-evolve the algorithms. Otherwise, you'll never get 100x. So we're gonna do some new stuff in hardware, and that new stuff is gonna look wrong relative to the algorithms and the software we're used to. And my message is, we're gonna to have to change those. What are the drivers of new architecture for this space? Well, because silicon efficiency is now, you could define it as the full use of available power. Um, <coughs> first of all, fill a chip with memory, or mostly memory. It's much more useful than logic that can't be turned on. Um, you need to keep the data local to where it's being used. In other words, distribute that memory all over the chip. Don't put it all in one box at one end and all the logic at the other end. Distribute it. Um, Serialize communication and compute. That's probably not obvious. I may have a chance to explain why that's power efficient later. Uh, cluster more chips, I mentioned. Also, there's a sort of uh, rule of thumb popular in the processor design community called Pollock's rule. Basically says you get a very poor return on investment of complexity. If you build a very complex processor, you get roughly square root return on it. So if your interest is in throughput, and you're building parallel machines, you're much better off building lots and lots of really simple machines than a few complicated ones. So massively parallel machines is what we need to build. Uh, and finally, because parallel programs are hard to get right and are also hard to map to highly parallel machines, we need a really simple programming abstraction. There is one that's intrinsically concurrency safe um, and is really simple to understand. And it also serializes compute communications, which happen to be power efficient. And that's called bulk synchronous parallel. And uh, might have time to think about that. Oh, yes. And very importantly, we're going to have to compile communication patterns between processing elements in the same way as we compile functions. Because if we don't, then our machine will probably be trying to do NP hard stuff like scheduling and memory and work allocation in real time. That will not be power efficient. Now, if you're gonna to have to compile communications, what that means is your graph structures, your model structures, are going to have to be at least pseudo static. I know that software guys like to, and girls, <coughs> like to make everything programmable and everything dynamic. Some compromise will be required. It's actually, when you think about it, it's exactly the same compromise as we had in the sequential world when we decided that writing self-modifying code wasn't necessary. Dynamic graph structures, fully dynamic graph structures, will turn out not to be necessary. They can be dynamically selected, compiled patterns, that's okay. So we need to build the machines, uh, I think, that look something like this. A pure distributed machine consisting of processors with ha which each have some local memory and which communicate with each other by sending messages over an interconnect which is deterministic and has no state in it. Uh, we may still have threads, 
but the purpose of the threads will just be to hide very local latencies, like branches and long execution times. Um, so probably not very many threads, certainly not thousands per processor. <clears throat> and this plan, therefore, looks quite different to the GPU plan today. Rather than one logic chip with some attached DRAMs, all the logic in one box, if you like, all the memory in the other boxes, uh, instead of that, build chips which are mostly memory. In fact, if you do that enough, you can get the power density down uh, even lower than your power limit, and then you can start bolting these things together and using the power budget. Um, what you'll end up with is much less memory, much less memory. In this example, 600 megabytes instead of 16 kilobytes. But you can access that 600 megabytes at spectacular bandwidth and zero latency. Can you use that to build a higher performance machine intelligence machine? I hope so, because that's what we've built. <laughs> uh, here's more, more detail. This, this is the chip where we will, uh, we haven't launched it yet, but we will launch it very, very shortly now, um, next, uh, next few months. Um, it has, well, actually, we put a pair down a P, on a 300-watt PCI card, um, and you end up with 2,500, roughly, processors, uh, each with about 256 kilobytes of memory, and they send messages to each other. And the intercommunication is all-to-all, -all, uh, completely deterministic, compiled, non-blocking, stateless. It's perfect interconnect. <coughs> um, we haven't actually declared what performance this thing will have, but it'll be at least 200 teraflops. Um, <clears throat> and like I say, about 600 megabytes altogether over those two chips. So not very much. We have to explore high machine performance with small memory footprint. The way in which it communicates between processors is this bulk synchronous parallel paradigm. I don't know how many of you have come across that, but the Basic idea is rather than overlapping communication and compute, you go through cycles. Um, a cycle starts with a synchronization, so everyone knows what time of day it is. Then there is a deterministic uh, exchange process in which processors exchange information that they're going to need in the next phase of their compute. That's memory to memory uh, communication. And then as each processor finishes its communication, it has all the stuff it needs, and it has sent out all the stuff that someone else needs, um, then it can go into its local compute on that memory locally. When it finishes its compute, it signals it's ready for the next synchronization. And the whole processor loops around this again and again and again. So the exchange parts only last as long as they need to, the, communication, uh, the com computation parts last as long as they need to. You do have to do a good job of load balancing your machine, so that each processor takes roughly the same amount of time, so you don't spend too much time waiting. Now, why is it a good idea to serialize communication and compute? I, like Bill, I've spent decades of my life trying to overlap these two things, <laughs> and, and now suddenly uh, we're trying not to overlap them. Well, so if you look at the top row here, this is, uh, this is what we used to do. Uh, at design time, we would decide how much of our energy and resources we would apply to the computation and how much we would apply to the communication. In other words, we've had our expectation of what a workload looked like. If the expectation was wrong, in this case, uh, communication is limited, um, then the, the computation would still take just as much time, but it would burn less power. Now, in the new world of power efficiency, silicon efficiency is using all the power all of the time, all the available power. So instead, do the bottom line. Build your machine so that when it's computing, it burns all the available power. And when it's communicating, it burns all the available power. And those two things don't overlap. Then if you get the budget wrong, what will happen is you will save time instead of power. And that's exactly what we want to do. So you're better off serializing these things than you are overlapping them, surprisingly. Uh, here's a real BSP execution trace, actually part of uh, ResNet 50 training, I think. So there are 2,500 or 2,400 tiles uh, sorted vertically, uh, and then horizontally uh, color-coded which 
phase of the BSP process those are in. Um, and you can see we, the purple bars are synchronizations. Um, and then we have yellow communication and dark blue is uh, computation. And then there's some light blue where people are waiting around. So, so a lot, light blue is wasted, wasted opportunity, wasted power. Um, if all the tiles are quiet, or so, or sorry, if some of the tiles are quiet consistently, then we can adapt the clocks to fill it in. Um, but generally, the idea is to reduce the amount of light blue. Um, and uh, if you take the whole of ResNet 50 training and uh, chop it into rows and just stack them up like this, this is, imagine that's one long, um, it's like a DNA trace, isn't it? Um, fold it up. That's what it looks like. So you can see, uh, optically, I don't know how much efficiency we're getting there, maybe 80%, probably. Room for improvement. <clears throat> and that's with a batch size of four very small batches. So our chip, that we call Colossus, integrates enough memory, enough static memory, to hold a large model on the chip. Um, or a, a larger model, so on the chip we can hold maybe oh, a pair of chips on a card. We can hold maybe a model of 100 million weights. Fairly large. If you want more than that, bolt more chips together. Um, you can run certainly billions of weights. So probably draw the line at tens of billions at this stage. But <laughs> as process node evolves, remember, the, memory, the amount of memory on the chip tracks that 2x. Nothing else tracks that 2x. So in other words, this scheme gets better as process evolves, whereas the old scheme gets worse. Um, it should be fairly obvious. We have actually published some early benchmarks, but not very much. Uh, go to our website if you're interested. Uh, but it should be fairly obvious that if, if you're dealing with things like RNNs or um, wave nets, that tend to bottleneck on memory on GPUs, then obviously this is going to solve the problem. There's essentially no bottleneck to memory. Uh, and you can get spectacular speed ups. We've seen speed ups of more than 100x on some of those applications. Um, but what about things where GPUs excel? In particular, sort of take a worst case scenario for memory. Um, so training a CNN where you're using big batches. <clears throat> so you have to keep all those activations from a big batch as you sweep forward because you're going to pick them up on the way back. <clears throat> Little sneak preview here of some work we've been doing. Lots of people have been publishing recently on how to make batches or how to survive ever bigger batches. <laughs> because today's machinery is more efficient with big batches. Um, but of course, no one's really had a motivation apart from us <laughs> to answer the question, what if you apply all that learning to small batches? Um, and uh, there's an upcoming paper uh, very shortly where, where we'll reveal the results of our uh, explorations by Dominic Masters and Carlo Luski, um, who are in our research team. And uh, we basically sweep the, uh, the base learning rate, in other words, the learning rate, modulated by batch size, so that all the runs take the same amount of time, same number of epochs. Uh, and if you're using a large batch size, it just means you do fewer updates of the weights. Um, and I'm just going to show you one example, but there are lots of examples in the paper. This one example is uh, ResNet 32 training on CFAR 100 with batch norm running over the full batch size. Uh, and we end up with plots like this. So on the left, you've got test accuracy against batch size. You can see very clearly that there's a peak in accuracy at pretty small batches. Um, there is a tail eventually because batch norm stops working when you go down to sort of one or two. Um, but actually, the peak is certainly not at thousands. It's at a few, in this case, at about eight. Gives you the best models. Um, you may also be able to pick up from these slides, the, the, the one on the right is the, uh, the same thing plotted against uh, learning rate. So each, each curve is a different uh, batch size. And in fact, the optimum batch size, batch size eight there, is a green curve. So again, you can see the second aspect, which is that small batches tend to be highly tolerant to learning rate. Bear in mind, this is base learning rate. So it's got nothing to do with how quickly you learn. They all take the same amount of compute. <clears throat> um, so small batch sizes not only produce better results, but actually they train more stably. Uh, and uh, some of the recent learning to try and get big batches to work better, uh, like Goyal's uh, warm-up um, sequence, it turns out they work well with small batches as well. <laughs> In other words, it helps everyone. So, so it doesn't actually 
change this result. Um, about two years ago, it was almost universally accepted that small batch training produced better results than big batch training. We've been through a phase where we've questioned that. It's still true. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to run a batch that's so small it would fit on one of our small memory chips. But it does mean that if your batch size doesn't need to be very large and you have built a chip which is very efficient for really, really small batches, in other words, really efficient for, say, batch size of one or two or four, then the number of machines that you can apply to a bigger batch, like 64, is much bigger than it would be if your machine, if each, each individual chip required a batch size of, say, 32. So SGD with small batches yields better models. Um, <clears throat> and machines that are efficient for very small models, maybe sub-batch size, do allow parallel learning over more machines, which is what everyone now wants to do. Nobody wants to wait two weeks or two months. <laughs> they want to throw more GPUs at it so that they only have to wait two hours. <clears throat> I'll send you the slides. <laughs> now, that's not all we need to do if we're going to get these small memory machines to work really well. I said this, is, this has got to be cooperation between hardware innovation, software innovation, algorithm innovation. We need to embrace other types of memory efficient algorithm. Uh, there are quite a few candidates, just chosen a couple here, um, tra trading recomputation for storage. In other words, if you can't memorize so much, recompute it instead. Uh, it's often more power efficient, actually, to redo a computation than it is to memorize it in a memory that's a long way away, like a DRAM. Um, and also, there's some very interesting recent work in reversible models that don't have to memorize all those forward activations, because actually they are effectively computed on the return sweep anyway. Um, here's a good example of the recomputation story. So this is a um, <coughs> DenseNet 201 training with a batch size of 16. Um, the orange curve is, is what TensorFlow allocates on a CPU. This is just a CPU trial um, in terms of uh, memory as it proceeds. So the x-axis is, is actually just a, a list of, an ordered list, time-ordered list of allocations that TensorFlow does. Um, and some of those allocations are for weights, some are for uh, activations, some are for other data structures. Um, but you, it's dominated by weights, of course. Um, you can actually do slightly better than TensorFlow uh, because TensorFlow is a little bit greedy, uh, so that's the gray curve. But actually, if you adopt the really simple strategy I've highlighted here um, of just saving the weights at the end of each residue block, uh, so that when you go back to that block, you compute the ones, you recompute the ones inside the block to do your backprop and weight update, um, then you can reduce the amount of memory you need by a factor of five. Uh, you have to do a bit more recompute, of course, because you're effectively doing parts of your forward sweep twice. Uh, and in this case, actually, the cost overhead is about 25%. So in a machine like this, that's not a bad trade. A fifth of the memory, 25% more compute. So finally, just to recap, um, throughput processors will become increasingly power limited. Um, I believe that we're not going to be able to voltage scale fast enough to allow them to do anything other than become memory dominated. In other words, I think all throughput processors are going to end up being mostly memory. Now, that's a really intriguing prospect, because we can fit, certainly fit hundreds of megabytes. We'll certain, soon be able to fit gigabytes of memory on the chip. And if that's the best we can build, let's learn to use it. Because the bandwidth available is terabytes, hundreds of terabytes, potentially. And we can really exploit that. <clears throat> um, if you've got your memory, your whole model on the chip, all the state immediately there, then there's no case for needing large batches to be efficient. The only reason you need large batches to, is to amortize latencies. There are no latencies. Um, so you can build machines that are efficient with really small batches. Uh, that allows you not only to produce better results, as I've shown you, but it allows you to use more chips across a batch size, which is ideal for an algorithm. Um, so you can achieve more uh, parallelism, uh, assuming you have enough dollars, obviously. We like to sell to people who've got plenty of dollars and don't mind how many chips they buy. <coughs> and uh, I haven't really had time to go into this, but 
efficient, massively parallel machines are going to have to compile their communication. It's part of the program. In a parallel computer, communication is part of the program. It needs to be compiled for efficiency for the same reason as other parts of the program. Uh, and I think in terms of abstraction, uh, bulk synchronous parallel, BSP, is simple. It's really easy for people to get their heads around. It's the only, as far as I know, message passing paradigm which is intrinsically concurrency safe. You cannot write software with a race hazard or a live lock or a deadlock in BSP. You can in almost any of every other idiom like CSP or uh, the actor model. Um, and because it serializes communications with compute, in this new world where we're power limited, it's actually very efficient. Um, so I advocate, however, however we build massively parallel processes, I advocate the BSP model as a good hardware software abstraction. Thank you. This is ResNet 50 training, by the way, layer-wise. <clears throat> Thank you, Simon. We have time for, uh, for a couple questions. So while we're waiting, uh, I, I forgot to mention, and I should have mentioned, that, that Simon's previous two uh, companies were also chip companies, and they sold for a combined value of a billion dollars. So I'm actually looking quite forward to, <laughs> to trying uh, the GraphCore chip uh, when it comes out. Um, Third time lucky. <laughs> Try to make it two billion this time. 20 billion. There's a question. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Perhaps the, the benefits of working with smaller batches is uh, related very much to what was discussed in the previous presentation, where if you're working with gradients, you don't really need high accuracy with your gradients. And so smaller batch sizes are essentially noisy gradients anyway. But if I wanted to work with larger batch sizes in, in this instance, uh, I suppose what I would do is take two of these chips, operate each of them with small batches each, and then train them in parallel, and, and, and then essentially aggregate the gradients together. Does that seem right? That's right. I think that's, that's the only uh, attractive answer, is to use clusters of chips. Okay. Rather than bolt together clusters of DRAMs to a big logic chip, instead build, logic dominate, sorry, build memory dominated chips and cluster those together instead. I do have another question as, as well. So it was also mentioned previously, you know, instead of performing CNN operations, you can perform a, a Fourier transform instead and, and reduce the operations, which seems really clear once you hear it. And yeah, I did think in processing, so yeah, that's kind of what you should do. Is this set up for doing something similar, or is it, is it something that would be pre-done in hardware, or would I have to kind of manipulate it to do it myself? Uh, as Bill mentioned, um, although we all talk about tensors, the arithmetic kernels that everyone's building are actually matrix, matrix, multipliers. Um, and if you're doing convolutions, a very efficient way of uh, using a matrix, matrix, multiplier is to do a one by one convolution. Uh, and then if you've got a three by three mask, you just do nine of those and add them together. <laughs> now, the nice thing about one by one convolutions is that they're completely compatible, 100% compatible with Wienergrad transforms, because a Wienergrad just produces a, a a mask of essentially one by ones. So yes. Okay. <laughs> quick, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So do you mean when you say small batch size, that means you're really talking about small memory footprint? Or are you actually saying small batch size? Because if you take like ImageNet, which is like 224 by 224, you know, it's really small. But we have, you know, if you talk to uh, medical imaging organizations, their images are already large. There are, I mean, if you look at the Chameleon 17 data sets, these are like 100K by 100K. So in your terms, when you say small batch size, you really mean like the size of the memory footprint. Is that correct? Uh, well, I think what I'm trying to say is that it is possible if you build memory centric machines and get the model onto the chip, then it is possible to build machines which are very efficient, even for batch size of one. Now, that doesn't mean that algorithmically you have to use a batch size of one. But if you had a situation, say, where your optimum batch size was 32, you could distribute over 32 chips. Whereas you can't today. Because if you run any of today's chips with a batch size of one, then the performance will be about 30 seconds of what it would have been if you ran with a batch size of 32. <laughs> um, so there would be no point. <clears throat> um, so I think the important thing is building chips with the capability that each chip only needs a very small batch size, and then you can aggregate chips together to build up whatever batch size you like. 
But it's certainly not the case that the sort of recent stuff about, you know, oh, look, we can survive batch sizes of 16,000. <laughs> That's not the same as saying that if you run with a batch size of 16,000, you'll get as good a model as running with a smaller batch size. All right, let's thank Simon one more time.